welcome to this online lecture of modern physics uh, we will now start with the first chapter we have discussed fourth chapter already atomic models now what we will do is we'll start from the first chapter and the first chapter is special theory of relativity in this lecture what we want to do is we want to have an introduction to the theory of relativity so we will try to answer this question of what is theory of relativity then we will revisit newton's laws of motion which you perhaps are studying in mechanics right now but we will revisit them briefly only uh, in context with special theory of relativity then and and that context is to do with inertial frame of reference you perhaps have an idea of what uh, inertial frame of reference are but uh, we will again revisit that concept also then we will go to postulates of special theory of relativity why special theory of relativity we'll come to that point in the in this lecture or in next lecture if we cannot cover all these topics today and then we will see consequences of the postulates that we will discuss okay there are only two postulate that we will discuss and what are the consequences of that are discussed in this last topic okay now rest of the chapter this whole chapter of special theory of relativity actually has to do with the consequences of the postulates of special theory of relativity in this case for this lecture we will only consider the consequences br briefly we will just have a hint of that and in rest of the chapter after that uh, we will discuss in detail what are different con consequences so let's try to answer this question of what is theory of relativity okay theory of relativity was proposed who proposed theory of relativity so albert einstein proposed this uh, theory of relativity and it was given to the world as a in as a part of papers first paper which was to do with special theory of relativity came in 1905 and the second paper which is to do with uh, the general theory of relativity as it is called as came 10 years after so it was Uh, published in 1915 so these two papers and of course there are series of papers when a theory uh, comes into picture so these two papers are however the most important part when this theory was introduced to the world by einstein okay so what is what is that theory this theory actually has to do with the measurement of space and time and it has to do with measurement of space and time even when the instrument which are making these measurements are in relative way, uh, relative motion with what is being measured okay let's consider one example for that suppose this is what what do you think this is it is a space shuttle and in this uh, spaceship there are these two points these two points Uh, are representing now some explosives so there are small explosives so that they don't blow up the space shuttle but they will they when they are exploded they will emit some light okay and suppose as seen from an observer uh, uh, an astronaut who is in the spaceship knows that the distance at which these two explosives are kept is suppose l okay so these two explosives are kept at distance l in the spaceship and therefore they are stationary with respect to spaceship so we are not yet talking about whether it is moving or not but an astronaut in the spaceship now knows that they are stationary they are not moving and they are at a distance l from each other now what happens is suppose at t1 in the clock of the astronaut who is present in the uh, spaceship at time t1 this first uh, bomb explodes then after some time suppose t2 at time t2 the second bomb also explodes okay so there is explosion of these two bombs which are kept at distance l as seen by the astronaut in the spaceship so for the astronaut what is the difference of time after which or what is the difference in between these two explosions how much time elapses between the explosions right it is t2 minus t1 right so this is and and we are already saying that l is distance between these two explosions because they are kept at that uh, distance uh, the explosion occurred at a distance l from each other 
so what we are we are discussing here is basically two events as we will call it uh, here onwards so ex explosion of the first bomb is the first event explosion of the second bomb is second event and these two event occurred by time of time difference of delta t and they occurred at a distance l away from each other is the scenario clear scenario clear to everyone now there is one more observer who is not in spaceship but in some way because uh, there is there is some arrangement let's consider this hypothetical situation where this observer also can see what is going on in the spaceship and this spaceship is in fact we moving with constant velocity with the observer so this observer is stationary right for, or rather for him he is stationary and the spaceship is moving with speed v okay now the same obs this observer let me call it as o or let me call it as o prime so how many observers do we have now in this scenario right right there are two observers the first observer let me call it as o who is in the spaceship and that spaceship and the bombs are no not moving for that observer that is called as that is referred to as frame of reference so this is frame of reference of this observer o in which the spaceship is not moving and then he is taking these measurement now we have another observer whom i am calling as o prime for this observer the spaceship is moving with constant velocity okay and now again he can measure time t1 prime when the first bomb exploded let's see for this observer the second bomb exploded at t2 prime and this t1 and t2 are being measured by this o prime this observer who is outside the spaceship relative to which the spaceship is moving with constant velocity v okay just keep that in mind whereas these times are being recorded by the observer o prime by by using a clock which is stationary to his frame of reference this clock which is used for measuring t1 and t2 is stationary to o prime okay so uh can you tell me now what is the direction of this clock which o prime is measuring or o prime is using what is direction and velocity of that clock for o can you tell me that see my point is this suppose you are sitting in a car okay and now if you consider a person who is standing on the footpath and watches your car pass by then for the person suppose you are moving in forward direction with speed 80 kilometers so let me draw this scenario so what we have is this pole or this observer who is stationary and a car is moving now in 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 this direction let me call this as x direction or z direction let's stick to that so for this observer this car suppose moves with a speed of 40 km per hour towards positive z axis okay now if you consider a person who is driving this car and if he is asked what is the speed of this person then his answer would be he would consider the car to be stationary because he is stationary with the car so for his frame of reference his car is stationary and this person is traveling in the opposite direction with the same speed so observer in the car would say that this person is traveling with speed of 40 km per hour towards negative z axis if every observer thinks that the observer himself or herself is stationary and he watches rest of the thing moving if you are if you are standing on the sun suppose hypothetical animal stands on the sun then the, for that person sun is stationary and the earth is revolving about the sun but if you if you are standing on the earth as we do now what we observe is the sun is moving in the uh, in the sky and therefore we for our observation the sun is in motion right this is the concept of relative motion between the two objects is this clear what i am trying to tell you here so in this case of the spaceship let me erase everything here so for the spaceship now uh, or rather for the observer in spaceship who is this o observer this clock which is used by o prime is traveling towards towards in this direction in the reverse direction with a speed which is v when this 
O prime measures time of the two explosions T1 prime and T2 prime. It is measured by a clock which is stationary to O prime. That is important. And now suppose he measures delta T prime, which is the time elapsed between the two explosions as seen by O prime. And suppose L prime is the length or is the distance. at which these two bombs were placed or l prime is the distance between the two events right so these are the two events that we are talking about now what we are saying is these two things these events are observed by an observer with uh, it was these two events are observed by an observer who is stationary to the events and delta t is time elapsed elapsed between the two events and l is distance at which these two events took place similarly we have another observer o prime for whom these events occurred with a relative uh, so these events occurred as they are in motion with speed v and time elapsed bet elapsed between these two events is t prime and the distance between them is l prime what is relation what should be the relation between delta t prime and delta t and what should be the relation between l and l prime they should be equal because time we say that time and space is absolute no matter from which frame of reference you measure time and length they should be always same ek second one second should be same for all the frame of reference doesn't matter if whether that clock is observed by someone who is stationary to the clock or by someone who is moving with relative to that clock similarly a stick a meter stick is of the length of 1 meter whether it is observed by a relative uh, by an observer who is stationary with respect to the stick or whether it is measured by an observer who is in relative motion with the stick classical physics used to believe that they are same but that actually is not the case the chapter is about these things okay as it turns out they are different so and and all these questions of why these they are different how can they be different and what is consequences of that how does that arise is answered by theory of relativity so is this idea clear of what theory of relativity is it is to do with measurement of space and time okay when there are two events in the uh, space somewhere then how much was the distance between these two events and how much was the time difference between these two events these kind of questions are asked and answered in special theory or rather theory of relativity we will stick to special theory of relativity okay so it has to do with measurement of space and time now this is this special theory of relativity when it was proposed in uh, in these two, by using with these two or three papers with a series of papers actually corrected classical mechanics and it corrected newton's theory also newton's theory of gravitation okay when when we say gravitation according to newton's theory the gravitation is the force which is given by this relation g m m by r square now einstein's relativity which is uh, the second part of theory of relativity which is general theory of relativity tries to, it sees this gravitation from a completely different uh, perspective it sees gravitation as curvature of space time we won't go into general theory of relativity it is beyond the scope of this paper mechanics of motion and it corrected gravitational theory but we don't or rather we still study those mechanics those class those theories in classical mechanics we still study newton's theory why is it so it is because the effects of special theory of relativity as well as the general theory of relativity are observable only when this motion relative motion is comparable with the speed of light as the speed of relative motion goes on increasing these effects are more and more uh, observable they are they are more and more prominent even if i consider this body which is moving with say 40 km per hour a car as observed by this observer who is standing on the footpath effects of theory, relativity are there i don't i'm not saying that they are not there but the effects are so small that you cannot uh, sense them in uh, day to day's world and when we consider gravity very low gravitation as we experience due to earth's uh, gravitational field or due to sun's gravitational field when we consider these gravitational fields these effects are 
almost not there we cannot sense that they are so small that we cannot perceive them the effects will start start coming uh, into play or they will become more and more prominent they will become observable when the speed goes on increasing and when it is comparable to speed of light similarly the effect of gravitation will start uh, being perceivable only when the gravitation is very high when we are talking about gravitation of a black hole Uh, which is a very massive uh, body then only these uh, these uh, effects will come into picture otherwise for our senses they are not observable and therefore we can still apply uh, classical mechanics and newton's gravitation to everyday's world okay but when we consider the heavier objects then we have to consider corrections which are due to general theory of relativity and and, and again when uh, we are considering motion which is very high or we are considering a relative motion which is comparable to speed of light then only the effects of special theory of relativity come into play is this clear any questions so far let me erase this now this is also important this uh, theory of relativity is the reason why we use space time term so this this term of space time came into picture due to special or it came into picture due to theory of relativity it it combines space or it unifies space and time in a different way we will not go into this depth but uh, just keep in mind that uh, many vectors for example electric field electric field is a vector now when special theory of relativity is used to explain the electric field or to write the electric field then it is done by using four vector representation is due to special theory of relativity again i am saying this is beyond the scope of our syllabus we will just have a brief introduction to theory of special theory of relativity but all these effects you should be aware of though we won't study it you should know that these what is what is ahead or beyond this point when we will stop discussing uh, theory of relativity all these things are waiting there for you the consequences of special theory of relativity are uh, remarkable and they are uh, surprising what happens is you can observe length contraction so a meter stick when when is observed by an observer who is not stationary with respect to the stick actually sees the stick contracted for him the the length of the stick is not 1 meter it is less than that so what you can say is space itself is contracted similarly time dilates clock start clocks which are in relative motion with an observer they start running slow so you can say that time slows down in a way then mass is not constant all we know now is mass is a, is a constant thing if i consider a uh, an object who is uh, intact which is not being broken into parts we know that mass is constant when you consider the special theory of relativity mass becomes variable as the relative motion or the speed of relative motion between the observer and the object changes the mass also changes everyone i am sure is familiar with this equation e equal to mc square right everyone has heard of hiroshima and nagasaki the tragic events of second world second world war right so i'm i'm sure everyone knows this equation e equal to mc square this equation is a consequence of special theory of relativity and we will derive this relation in this course okay we will derive e equal to mc square when it comes to other part of relativity which was proposed in 1915 uh, which is called as general theory of relativity they predict black hole in classical mechanics there is no place for things like black hole they they are explained only by general theory of relativity and it is consequence of uh, relativity because of that reason so any questions are there any question no way special theory of relativity or general theory of relativity says that time travel is possible okay this not should be in double quotes special theory and none of these theories predict uh, time travel so let's now move on let's try to answer this question let's try to further answer this question of what is uh, theory of relativity as i said it it has to do with measurement of space and time now theory of relativity can be divided into two parts okay the first one is the special theory of relativity which was proposed by einstein in 1905 okay the next part of theory 
of relativity is general theory which was proposed in 1915 so they were proposed at a difference of uh, 10 years and there is reason to that special theory of relativity is much simpler uh, in context of mathematics and the concepts whereas when it comes to general theory of relativity the mathematics is much evolved at this level even you can uh, have a sense of why we have all these effects of special theory of relativity which is not true about general theory of relativity you can try to answer that in some science fictional way science popularization way but uh, it needs a very evolved mathematics for studying general theory of relativity so what we are sticking to is special theory of relativity now what is so special about special theory of relativity is this it it is applicable only to inertial frame of reference in simple wor simple words it is applicable only to frame of reference which are not accelerated so the observer and what is being measured they may be in uh, relative motion with each other but both these frame of reference are traveling with constant velocity there is no acceleration in any of these frame of reference whereas when it comes to general theory of relativity it is applicable to non inertial frame of reference and therefore then you talk about the frame of reference which are accelerated frame of reference now discussion of general theory of relativity starts with something which is uh, referred to as equivalence principle we are not going into this equivalence principle we are not going into this part it is beyond the scope of our syllabus what we will discuss is this part only so but just to uh, just so that you know that equivalence principle basically tries to say that acceleration and the effects of acceleration and gravitation they are equivalent and then it tries to answer the question of what happens to space time measurement in um when you have accelerated frame of reference or when you have when you have gravity okay so so this is when it comes to large stru uh, structures in the universe these black holes uh white dwarf stars when you talk about all these things they are massive object the gravitation is very high and therefore effects of general theory of relativity are taken into account otherwise they will give us error in our predictions and therefore whenever it comes to astrophysics general theory of relativity is the starting point just like mechanics starts with newton's laws of motion uh, astrophysics starts with discussion of general theory of relativity which is beyond of beyond our syllabus i keep saying that general theory of relativity is very evolved theory uh, as far as mathematics is concerned and therefore it is very rich in mathematics and concepts and it is not possible for us to discuss this at this stage so we will be sticking to the simpler sibling of general theory of relativity which is special theory of relativity okay newton's laws of motion you are perhaps studying them right now in uh, physics paper 1 isn't it uh, can you tell me what is the first law then newton's first law sorry a body continues to stay in the state of motion of constant velocity or sta uh, state of rest unless it is being acted by external force this is important and then second law is what is second law so f is equal to ma why do we need, why do we have two laws because in this law in second law if i plug in f is equal to 0 what is a it is equal to 0 mass of the object can, is not zero if we are talking about a massive object then m may be, m may have any arbitrary value but a is zero so isn't this second law also explaining the first law so can i say that the first law is special case of second law if i make this statement that uh, first law is special case of second law will that be correct will i answer you that is not the case first law and second law we need both these laws they are different we unless and until we have both these laws the mechanics is not complete so you cannot say that newton's first law is special case of newton's second law why it is because of this reason let me ask you this uh, is second law always applied is it always applicable or is it applicable only to certain situations 
this law second law f equal to m a this equation is correct is applicable only in inertial frame of reference clearly you have a vehicle which is moving in this direction and it is being accelerated now suppose on the floor there is a ball a football let's say a, a football is kept on the floor of this vehicle which is being accelerated at acceleration a now if you see in from anywhere either you are you yourself are in this uh, carriage this vehicle or you are standing outside is this ball accelerated yes no so that there is no friction between the ball and the floor and if this person is stationary with the vehicle then this this person will see that the ball is being accelerated in the opposite direction similarly for this for this person it is not you are right for this person who is outside the box the ball is not accelerated whereas for the person who is in the vehicle will see the ball accelerated now is there any force acting on the ball there is no ex, there is no external force in horizontal direction but yet this person who is standing in the vehicle who is being accelerated along the vehicle sees that this ball is accelerated and therefore this first law clearly uh states that it should be in state of rest or it should be in the state of constant velocity which is not happening even when there is no force acting on this ball this ball is being accelerated and therefore for this person for this observer who is in accelerated motion the second law is now not applicable so it is applicable only to the person who is in inertial frame of reference who is stationary who is not accelerated okay not stationary who is not accelerated who is in inertial frame of reference so that's why we need the first law in this way you can check you can have a test object where on which no external force is acting just like for this person there is no external force acting on the ball and if the objects now starts accelerating that means the person now can conclude that he is or he or she is in non accelerated frame of reference so this first law basically defines what is inertial frame of reference all of you are aware of the third law which is basically this uh, action and reaction law and the constraint which is there for the second law that it is applicable only in inertial frame of reference is not correct for uh, third law it is always applicable whether your frame of reference is inertial or non inertial newton's third law is always applied right okay so we will now try to answer this question of what inertial frame of reference are but before that let's try to understand what is frame of reference so what is frame of reference frame of reference basically is an imaginary coordinate system where this is x axis let me draw it here so that it doesn't overlap so this is a coordinate system with x y and z axis as far as you are using Cart cartesian coordinate system and this is a observer with respect to this observer when this coordinate system is not moving it is stationary with respect to the observer then you say that this is the frame of reference for this observer let me call that observer as o right similarly if i consider some other frame of reference or other imaginary coordinate system these axes may not be visible there but in principle there is a way to construct such type of uh, such type of coordinate system so suppose we have another observer let me call that as o prime and therefore let me call these axes as x prime y prime and z prime now suppose this coordinate system is moving with constant velocity v with respect to o okay so with respect to this coordinate system and since the coordinate system is stationary to this observer to the observer this whole coordinate system and the observer is moving with constant velocity v towards the right for this person the coordinate system is considered to be o which is stationary with respect to that and when this observer makes measurement of time and length or first let's discuss the length so when this observer o makes the measurement of length it does so by using the coordinate system which is stationary to it right the observer makes the measurement of time so that this clock is stationary to his frame of reference or to the observer so all the measurement which are performed by the observer when we say that a person is measuring some distance or time some length or time then these measurements are performed using instruments which are stationary to the observer okay similarly for this person 
if you consider for o prime when the person makes an measurement the measurements are made by using the instruments which are stationary to o prime which are stationary to this observer so for this observer for observer o what is speed with which this clock is moving this clock which is being used by o prime let me repeat ah uh, once again i guess uh, it's not very clear so what is frame of reference then i'll again repeat frame of reference basically is a coordinate system or in principle there exists such coordinate system x y and z so that this observer o or this observer in frame of reference o measures all the measurements or measures all the lengths and time by using instruments which are stationary to this coordinate system o so when this observer is making measurement of length and time it is using the observer is using a scale which is stationary which is stationary to the observer o okay so whenever when you say that you are uh, or when you when the, you hear this sentence that measurements of length or time are being measured from frame of reference of o what it means is you have an observer who is stationary to that coordinate system and the clock and the lens or clock and the scales which are being used by this observer for the measurement are stationary with respect to that observer now i imagine another coordinate system where i named the axis as a x prime y prime and z prime where this coordinate system now is moving with speed v with respect to this coordinate system o so with respect to this frame of reference with respect to frame of reference o this frame of reference which i am calling as o prime is moving with constant speed v okay now let's imagine an observer in this frame of reference o prime right if this observer is in uh, is is in coordinate system or is in frame of reference o prime if this observer o observes this observer o prime what is the speed of this observer o prime for o it is v moving towards right why because this o prime now is frame of reference of this observer that means it is stationary to the observer and since the whole coordinate system is moving with respect to v for this o for this observer in o this this observer in o prime is also moving with same speed right similarly now suppose lens and time are now being measured by the observer o prime or which is being measured in this frame of reference o prime right so if it is being measured by the observer in o prime what it means is these scales these meter sticks and these uh, this clock should be stationary with respect to this observer it should be stationary with respect to the uh, which respect to reference frame of o prime let me again ask the first question that i asked you initially for observer o what is speed of the clock which is being which is being used used by o prime it is also v and the scale they are also this whole coordinate system is moving now next thing is uh, what is inertial frame of reference and we have Uh, i have tried it at length to explain that any frame of reference in which first law is obeyed is inertial frame of reference so you test whether the first law is correct or not if that first law newton's first law turns out to be the correct then you can say that it is inertial frame of reference and whenever we have inertial frame of reference we can use special theory of relativity when it comes to accelerated frame of reference or non inertial frame of reference uh, general theory is to be used in simple words you can say that it is non uh, non accelerated frame of reference but why it is important to define it in this way because it gives you a way to test the acceleration even without any sensors okay you can test one object you can keep one object on which there is no external force acting and if the object starts accelerating that means the first law is not correct or the first law is not being obeyed in that frame of reference and therefore it is not inertial frame of reference is it clear and this is the third thing if you have one inertial frame of reference you know that this is inertial frame of reference let me say o 
let suppose you have another inertial frame of ref another frame of reference o prime which is moving with constant velocity v with respect to this o frame of reference then you can safely say that this o prime is also inertial frame of reference now let's discuss the first postulates of special theory of relativity okay it is simple in, th in fact uh, if it is intuitive what it says is laws of nature are same for all inertial frame of reference doesn't matter from which frame of reference you observe uh, a particular thing in nature it should behave same okay apart from the relative velocity the laws of nature would not change right and and therefore what this means is there is no preferred frame of reference in the universe you can choose any frame of reference which is inertial frame of reference and that is as good as any other inertial frame of reference and therefore there is no preferred frame in the universe and lack of that that lack of that preferred frame of reference in the universe gives rise to all the uh, effects of special theory of relativity right since there is no preferred frame of reference in the universe we can see so many phenomena which come under this special theory of relativity and you can they are there because there is no preferred frame of reference okay and laws of electromagnetics should not be an exception to that right should not be exception why i am mentioning it will be clear so uh, this is the title perhaps it is translated in english but this is the title of einstein's paper in 1905 which first introduced special theory of relativity to the world the title is on the electromagnetic or electromagnetics of moving bodies this was the reason or in fact uh, how einstein came up with this particular uh, theory is perhaps through thinking about the electromagnetics or uh, by thinking about the nature of light as given by uh, electromagnetic theory or as given by maxwell's electromagnetic theory it was quite new at that time Max maxwell through his four equation proposed that light is uh, light is uh, electromagnetic wave this happened somewhere around uh, 1857 if i am not wrong so when einstein proposed his theory this electromagnetic theory was quite new maxwell's theory was quite new it was just 50 years old not more than that okay and therefore in fact the special theory of relativity was introduced in an attempt to make sense of maxwell's electromagnetic theory and classical mechanics so let's now first let's now move on to nature of electromagnetic wave why we are discussing it will be clear in a minute uh, because then that will lead us to second postulate of uh, special theory of relativity right so maxwell's theory of electromagnetics predicts light as electromagnetic waves and according to that theory speed of light is given by this relation 1 divided by square root of mu0 by epsilon0 where what do you think epsilon0 and mu0 are yes it is permeability of free space when there is no matter present right similarly this epsilon0 is permittivity of free space on now so this is the first postulate we just saw the first postulate that or rather the first postulate is uh laws of nature should be same in all frame of reference right this is animation which i have picked up from uh wikipedia if you search electromagnetic waves in wikipedia you will get the article wikipedia article in which this animation is shown see what what are electromagnetic wave what happens is suppose at this point you have a charge particle let's say of charge plus q and what you do is you make this particle oscillate with some frequency nu so this charge particle is now performing simple harmonic motion of this frequency nu i'm considering this particular point in space and what will happen at that point is since the charge since the distance of this charge particle from this point is continuously changing it is oscillating simple harmonically what will happen is electric field also oscillates there at that point similarly when electric field is changing with respect to time magnetic field is induced okay so in this way suppose electric field is oscillating at this point since this charge is oscillating 
what happens is the oscillating electric field produces magnetic field it induces magnetic field which is perpendicular to change in electric field now that changing magnetic field in turn produces changing electric field and in this way the effect of uh, changing electric and magnetic field they give rise to a traveling wave so just keep these two things in mind okay when we discuss second postulate keep the first postulate in mind which says that laws of physics are same in all fra inertial frame of reference irrespective of their velocity or relative motion and the second is electromagnetic waves are produced in this way due to changing electric and magnetic field which keep on producing each other and the effect travels in space okay so let me erase this let's now move on to the second postulate suppose this is an observer this the, this is an observer which let me call as o or let me call this as a observer so this frame of reference is a now when this observer observes another vehicle let's say which is moving with speed of 20 km per hour so to observer a this vehicle which is in frame of reference of b is moving with speed 20 km per hour okay then the same observer a also observes a also observes that there is another vehicle which overtakes this b with speed say 60 km per hour velocities or speeds for frame of reference a what are these speeds first speed of this vehicle b is equal to 20 km per hour and speed of c is or let me write vc is 60 km per hour is this clear is this cl uh, scenario scenario clear imagine yourself standing on the footpath and you observe two vehicles one is b which is traveling with this speed and there is another vehicle which is c which is moving with speed 60 km per hour is this clear any any questions in this so now let me ask you this suppose i consider speed from frame of reference b what is the speed of vehicle c can you tell me that right if there was another vehicle which was overtaking with speed 100 km per hour to both these vehicle as seen from frame of reference a so as same as seen from frame of reference a if there was this third vehicle let me call that as d which overtakes uh, with speed 100 km then what would be speed of that v d as measured by b it would be 80 km okay now let's continue suppose the same observer we have so this is a vehicle which is now moving or this is a spaceship which is now moving with speed c i am doing this for simplicity you could have done the same complete same calculations for any speed i am considering c by 2 so that we have uh, ease of calculating things okay so this is a spaceship which is moving with speed c by 2 where what is c c is speed of light in vacuum so it is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second so this vehicle so this spaceship is moving with this high speed as seen by a okay where let me call this as b now suppose there is a light beam a pulse of light which is which passes by which overtakes this spaceship with speed c it is it is of course has the speed c this uh, when if the light is traveling in vacuum its speed is c which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second right what do you what should be speed of this pulse for b c by 2 this is what our classical uh relativity tells us am i right he or she does it by using uh, maxwell's equations am i right he has to apply maxwell's equation to that light pulse to that pulse of light 
which is traveling in vacuum and therefore for a what should be speed of light it should be equal to square root of mu 0 by epsilon 0 now the this turns out to be equal to 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second which is equal to c okay this is for a right now for b suppose that also that person also uses uh, maxwell's equations and he calculates speed of light in vacuum what is speed of light in vacuum for b according to maxwell's equations what is it remember the first postulate first postulate says that laws of physics are same for all frame of reference right so for even for frame of reference b what should be the how should what should be the speed of light it should be equal to 1 by square root of mu 0 by epsilon 0 which turns out to be equal to 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second are you getting my point classical relativity or classical calculations for relative speed what we should have is speed of light should be equal to c by 2 now uh, i don't know how much of it it is true but i have read somewhere that einstein thought about special theory of relativity in this way he asked himself that what should he observe if he runs if he managed to run with a speed of light traveling or if the observer is running with speed c alongside this wave what the person should observe is that only oscillating electric and magnetic field he will not observe any motion in that pulse as given by classical relativity remember this i, I keep saying this this is as given by classical theory of relativity and whether that is true or not is was the question for einstein now he assumed that maxwell's theory is correct now if maxwell's theory is correct no matter what is your speed what is your speed with what uh, speed you are running as far as you are in frame of reference or as far as you are in inertial frame of reference speed of light should be always 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second it is always given by that uh, relation 1 divided by square root of mu 0 into epsilon 0 now can you do you see the discrepancy there either the cal uh, calcula calculations of classical mechanics were wrong which were telling him that he would observe electric and magnetic field which are stationary and which are oscillating if he manages to run alongside speed of uh, alongside uh, uh, light pulse and there was this maxwell's theory which was telling that no matter what is the speed he should he will always observe the speed of light as 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second uh, one of the theory should be wrong and what einstein assumed was that classical calculations are wrong he assumed that electromagnetic theory or he assumed that maxwell's electromagnetic theory is correct uh, second postulate of special theory of relativity is it says that speed of light is vacuum in its same for all frame of reference no matter whether two frame of reference are in relative motion speed of light is always same which is c so now um, this is a further consequences of that this is not actually postulate this one is the postulate this we will show that is a consequence consequence that uh, c or speed of light turns out to be upper limit for speed of anything in, a, in the universe and this is very interesting question suppose this is the sun okay and and then earth we know it revolves about this sun due to gravitational force of attraction am i right the necessary centripetal force for this rotational motion uh, of the earth about the sun is provided by gravitational force between them in hypothetical situation suppose the sun vanishes at time at some point at t is equal to zero the sun vanishes what should happen in this situation to the uh, orbital of earth orbit of the earth because earth is moving with some velocity it has some instantaneous velocity at the instance at as the at the uh, moment when the sun disappears suppose that is equal to v so velocity at t is equal to zero suppose is equal to v zero okay so 
now since the sun has gone there is no external force acting on the earth what should happen according to newton's first law it should it should travel without any acceleration it should continue to stay in the same state of velocity and therefore what will happen is if this is uh, the magnitude of the velocity and if this is the direction it is instantaneous direction of the velocity then it should it should start traveling with that Uh, velocity with that speed along this direction, right? The rotational motion would be gone because the sun, which is which was providing the necessary centripetal force, is now gone, right? But after how much time does this happen? Does it happen at t is equal to zero, or someone just said that there is a delay? So what exactly is that delay now? See, so what happens is there is delay. because even when this sun is gone this effect will take time this information that there is no sun will take time to travel from this point from the sun to reach earth so this information that the sun is not there will take time which is equal to r which is suppose the distance between the sun and the earth at that point divided by c which is speed of light in the in in vacuum okay so after this much time the even if the sun has dip, disappeared the earth would have no information about that and therefore it would continue to move in the same object uh, same orbit but exactly after this time when the information reaches here that there is no sun the earth then after that delay will start traveling in straight line without any speed so when you say that it is upper limits speed of light is upper limit to speed of anything in the universe that means anything so the second postulate of relativity is that uh, speed of light is same for all frame of reference now one of the predictions of that is speed of light is the upper limit to speed of anything in the universe and when it comes to particles which have non zero rest mass for example protons electrons all these particles we consider their masses as non zero now let's quickly uh, see what is consequence of that of of the second postulate okay now we will focus uh, on what is the consequence of second postulate i am assuming three or two observe observers here so this is our first observer o this is the second observer o prime which is in this uh, spaceship which is traveling with speed of c by 2 so to this observer o this spaceship is traveling with speed of uh, c by 2 its speed is c by 2 where c is speed of light okay and then assume that there is another light pulse which is overtaking both these which is overtaking this spaceship with speed c of course because speed of uh, light is same for all frame of reference okay is this clear is this situation clear suppose at t is equal to 0 this is the position of observer o this is pos position of observer o prime and this is the position of the pulse so along this axis say along x axis all of them assume the same position x value of all these three um, things that we are discussing observer o o prime and the light pulse they are they have the same coordinate x at t is equal to 0 okay now what will happen after one second can you answer this question what will ha happen after one second let's try to figure this out okay after one second can you guess what is going to be this distance distance between the observer o and the pulse of light right we know that speed of light is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second and therefore after one second this light pulse will travel a distance which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter because its speed is c after 1 second this is the distance between the observer o and the pulse of light now as measured by o by the same observer what is this distance let me call that as l x by 2 if you consider x as the distance between the observer and the light pulse as x then it is x by 2 or you can say it is equal to c by 2 Or, or let me write three into ten to the power eight meter per second. Uh, three three into ten to the power eight divided by two. So this distance oh. is going to be equal to c by two meters, 
right is this clear what is this distance for o prime what is the distance for the observer o prime and light pulse it is c see what we mean what we said in second postulate is speed of light is same for all frame of reference no matter what is the relative uh, velocity between two observers both of them will measure the light speed of light as same which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second that means what is speed of this light pulse for observer o prime it is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second according to the second postulate right and therefore for o prime again this distance should be equal to c which is equal to 3 into 10 to the power not c it is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter right but so this basically is a discrepancy I say this discrepancy can be removed by saying that as space is measured by l and l prime where l is measurement of space or measurement of distances when i say space it means measurement of distances for o prime and l is measurement of distances for o then l is not same as l prime we will see that this this l and l they will be different for these two observers because of their uh, relative speed between each other similarly when they measure time when they measure t suppose t is time as measured by observer o and say t prime is uh, time as observed by o prime they are also not same so that the measurement of time and space now are different for different observers when there is relative motion between them space and time are no longer absolutes but they are relative depending on from which frame of reference they are being measured the values of measurement of length and time will be different okay so let's quickly summarize what we have discussed we have discussed the theory of relativity we introduced theory of relativity there are two parts to uh, theory of relativity one is spatial theory of relativity which is applicable only to inertial frame of reference it is applicable only to frames of references which are not accelerated frame of frames of reference and how do you check whether a frame of reference is inertial or not that is given by newton's first law so when a frame of reference is inertial frame of reference then measurements in that frame of reference give rise to effect which we call as special theory of relativity general theory of relativity is applicable for non inertial frames of references and for acceleration for that matter then we discussed we defined what inertial frame of reference are i just tried to explain that when newton's first law holds correct or newton's first law defines inertial frame of reference then we considered the two postulates of relativity the first postulate is laws of physics are same in all, all frame of references and the second postulate is uh, speed of light is same in all inertial frame of references irrespective of the relative motion between these frames of references then uh, so these are the two postulate okay Th that is that is uh, all for this particular presentation if there are any questions please let me know now